He has risen. He has risen Amen. Yes. That is not your official greeting. You'll get that a little later when Sue begins our service. I do have one announcement, though, that I want to share with you, and you may have already noted it. Our water pressure in the building is intermittent. Let me put it that way. I think our pressure switch out here needs a little work, which is not something you're going to get somebody to do on Easter. And so I would encourage you all just to be mindful of that um, and do whatever it is that you feel is necessary on that. Um, uh, just wanted you to know that we're aware of it and we'll be working on it. We should have it remedied in the week, but uh, it is a little bit, these things wait till Easter <laughs> to do that sort of thing. So uh, it is good to be together with you though today. So, oh, I don't know what that was about. Sue, begin our service if you would. Good morning. He did steal my opening line, but it bears repeating. He is risen. He is risen. risen indeed. Welcome to each of you on this beautiful Resurrection Sunday morning. Pastor John reminded us last week, uh, as if we could forget, that last year at Easter, we were not able to be together to worship, to celebrate. And I think we can probably all agree it's, it's been kind of a difficult year. But the event we're celebrating today gives us hope. There is hope in the risen Savior. Amen. Romans chapter 6 verse 4 says, We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may have new life. The cross could not hold him. The tomb could not keep him. So let us rejoice in our resurrected Lord. Will you join me in prayer? Gracious, loving, Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for this opportunity to come together as those who believe in you, who have hope in you, to worship you, to glorify you. We're so grateful, Lord, for the ultimate gift that you gave us, the gift of your resurrected Son and the promise of eternal life for those who believe in him. Be with us as we worship today. Be with us as we remember the events of the week prior to Easter and celebrate the event of Easter morning. Thank you, Lord. And in all that we say and do and think, may we honor and glorify you. In the name of Jesus Christ, our risen Savior, amen. If you'd like to open your Bibles, we will be reading from John chapter 21, verses 1 through 14. And this passage uh, prefaces um, what Pastor John will be sharing with us and, uh, and ties into his, the topic of his message. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, 
but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, Friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, Throw your net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you have just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. None of the disciples, di disciples dared ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Thank you, Sue. Let's stand and sing, Christ the Lord is risen today. If the Yeah. 
my burden so found liberty at Calvary. Now I believe in Jesus everything. Now I gladly own him as my king. Now my rapture so can only sing of Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon oh, there was multiplied to me. There my burden so found liberty at Calvary. Oh, the love that through salvation's plan. I feel like I wanted to sing that with you. Uh, today it's Easter and I know that there's some young people here and we don't want to take away from the activity that they have planned for the, the kids down in the, the children's department. So we are not going to have a formal children's story today. We're just going to release them to go down there. But I do want to kind of point out a couple things. Um, we have not been able to do some of the things that, we've not, that we normally do. Um, and one of them is Love Feast. We in the Church of the Brethren normally have a uh, service on Monday, Thursday, which is a celebration of that last supper that Jesus had with the, with the disciples. We take communion on that Sunday or on that day. We, take, we do foot washing, which is uh, something that Jesus did, and you see it in the account in John's Gospel. Um, we share with each other in a simple meal. It is a, a wonderful time that we have to share with each other. And it is something that is open to all of God's people. If you, uh, I'm, I'm putting in a plug right now for next year. Um, we weren't able to do it this year just simply because we, there were too much closeness uh, that would have happened as a result of that. And so we wanted to uh, extend the invitation for you to be putting it. It's on the same Thursday every year the Thursday before Easter, and so we would love to uh, have you be thinking of that. If you have any questions about that, you're welcome to come and talk to me about it. I'd love to, to visit with you about that. So, if the kids are ready, I believe, well, I don't know, Brittany, are you ready? <laughs> I, should ask, I should ask Brittany and Amber if they're ready, because uh, they're the ones that will be leading this, and if, you would like to, if the kids would like to go down, they're welcome to be dismissed uh, for that period. We're going to sing two songs right in a row, I'm hoping, just boom, boom. So if you're a person that likes to use a hymnal, the first song is a projection. The second song is in your hymnal if you like. It's in the red hymnal, page 317, the old rugged cross. But today we're, we're going to start with, I believe, in a hill called Mount Calvary. So let's stand. And we'll do the projected part first, then flip over to your hymnal if you want. It'll still be on the screen if you need, don't want the hymnal.
So you have your Bibles open still, right, to that last chapter of John. Sue shared with us a story that John relates about Jesus coming to the disciples there on the shore of Galilee, had a nice breakfast, enjoyed each other's company for a moment. And then it picks up again in the 15th verse. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said it to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hand and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you don't want to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. And this he said to him, follow me. I'm going to conclude the reading there. You're welcome to read the rest of that chapter if you'd like. But this is where I want to take off from. In Acts chapter 2, Luke tells us about the way that the disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit on that day of Pentecost. He said that they were all together in that, in that one place, and suddenly there was a, a, a sound like the rushing of a strong wind, and it filled the place where they were. At the sound of that rushing wind, uh, it was all around them, and then Divided tongues, like, like tongues of fire, came and settled on each of them. And Luke says that each of them were filled with the Spirit. And they started speaking in languages that, that were not their own as the Spirit equipped them. Now apparently in Jerusalem at this time, there were people, Jews from all over the known world, who were staying in Jerusalem. And as the disciples, who were becoming apostles now, they spoke to them in their native languages, there was confusion. There was amazement at what was happening Aren't these, aren't these guys from Galilee? Aren't these provincial fishermen? What's going on here? How can they speak our language? Now, most of them were perplexed, confused, but some of the crowd sneered, accused them of being drunk. I guess that makes sense. When we hear things that we don't understand, we can be a little harsh, maybe even a little judgy. But Peter, Peter's having none of it. He stands up in front of the crowd, bold as can be, even those that were mocking the disciples, and he says, hey, these guys aren't drunk. It's only nine in the morning after all. No, what's, what's going on here, Peter says, is what you should have been expecting. This is what the prophet Joel was talking about. The day when the very Spirit of God would come, would come upon God's people Sons and daughters would prophesy, and young men would see visions, and old men would dream dreams. Even the very lowest and the least, the slaves, both men and women, would receive this outpouring of the Spirit. Everybody gets it. They will prophesy. And then Peter gets to the difficult part. He, he gets right to it. Jesus is the reason for all of this. And Jesus, well, he pins the blame for the death of Jesus right on those people listening. Jesus of Nazareth, he says, Nazareth, he says, testified to by signs of power and wonders, you killed him. But that's not the end of the story, Peter says. There's more. There's more. Even though that's what happened, even though you guys put him to death, God has other plans. God freed him from death. Jesus has been raised, Peter says, resurrected, and is now exalted at the right hand of God. Hallelujah. Let the entire house of Israel know with certainty, he says, that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus that you crucified. 
And then Luke goes on to tell us, many in the crowd were cut to the heart. They were convicted. They were penitent. They asked what they should do. And as a result of this bold proclamation of Peter, this powerful preaching, 3,000 are added to the number of the church that day. That's awesome, isn't it? Pentecost. That, that powerful story from Acts. That is an event that is a happening. That is something momentous that you can mark time by. This pouring out of the Spirit, the wind, the, di the divided tongues like fire, the speaking in other languages, this awesome sermon from Peter. It all illustrates the way that the Spirit can change things, make things new, can empower us in ways that are both miraculous and almost instantaneous. I mean, think about this. This is, this is Peter we're talking about, right? Right? You guys know Peter. This is Peter that we're talking about. Now, don't get me wrong. Boldness was always a part of Peter's DNA. He didn't have any problem with the boldness part. He was always ready to say things and do things before anybody else even had thought about it or maybe thought better of it. It often got him into trouble. But what we see here in Acts, it seems to be a whole nother Peter not the one that we see in the Gospels. This is somebody else. This is the one that Jesus envisions when he says that Peter will be the rock on which the church is built. This is the Apostle Peter, all capital letters. The leader of the, the Jerusalem church, the, the missionary to Cornelius, uh, the, the, the one that, had, that, that, that guided this budding Christian movement safely and securely in its first decades. And because of the way that Luke relates this story, we know that it's because of the Spirit, the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit makes Peter who Peter is here on this side of Pentecost. It's true. It's true. The Spirit of God does make Peter who he is as a Christian, a faithful follower of Jesus. But I think it might be a mistake to think that that all happened at Pentecost, as if that rushing wind, that divided tongues like fire, flipped some sort of a switch in Peter that turned him into some kind of a super apostle. Pentecost is an event. It is a happening. It is something you can mark time by. But Peter's becoming, it's more of a process. You see, the story of Peter, and you know this, the story of Peter doesn't start there in Acts 2. It starts a long way before that, back in the Gospels. And if you've read this, you know that the story of Peter is more a story of failure than it is of success. We see time and time again the way that Peter missteps. He speaks out of turn. He misinterprets what Jesus is doing. On one occasion, Jesus even had to say to him, Get behind me, Satan! Get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. I'm tripping over you. You got your mind in the wrong place. Peter, instead of, instead of leading the disciples, he's often dragging them back, keeping them from what they should be. And we see this, the most troublesome, heart-wrenching image of Peter in the final hours before Jesus' death. This is, this is the tough stuff. After all the disciples are scattered, they're, they're in the garden with Jesus. They're, they're, the, Jesus is arrested and the disciples are scattered. Peter follows uh, the, the events from a distance. He kind of creeps along behind and he comes into the courtyard of the high priest. And as he warms himself there by a charcoal fire there in the night, he's challenged. He's pressed against. According to John, he's first challenged by a woman who keeps the gate, a servant in the high priest's house. Well, then by the group that's there gathered around him in the courtyard and finally by a slave. And Peter, Peter denies Jesus each time. I am not his disciple. I am not. I am not. I don't know him. Now, Jesus had predicted this. He saw it coming. He knew exactly how it would play out. He had told Peter, when Peter claimed that he would never abandon his Lord, that, yeah, you will. You're going to do it three times before the rooster even crows in the morning. And that's exactly what Peter did. He failed. 
failed miserably. I mean, outside of Judas, I don't think that there was a disciple that fell so far. Matthew's gospel, Matthew says that at the third time that he's questioned and Peter curses, he swears an oath, he's, no, I don't know this Jesus that you're talking about. And at that very moment, the rooster crows and Peter is reminded he remembers what Jesus had said and he, he runs from the courtyard weeping bitterly. That's how Matthew puts it. He is crushed. He is ashamed. He is wrecked. Is there any way to come back from this? This is why John 21 is so beautiful. Now remember where we are in this story. We talk about John 21. At this point, all of that fear, all of that betrayal, all of that's in the past. The anguish of Jesus in the garden where he cried those great tears like, like drops of blood, that is behind us. The pain of the cross, that is behind us. Even the empty tomb is behind us at this point. Jesus has already appeared to his faithful followers. We see it in John 20. We see that he appeared to Mary Magdalene and then in verse 19 of that chapter there's a story of how he comes to the other disciples minus Thomas. That's a little bit later. They're in that locked room and he says, peace be with you. And he shows them his hands and he shows them his side. And there's that important part which might challenge our concept of the event of Pentecost. Jesus breathes on them and says receive the Holy Spirit there at that moment perhaps the receiving of the Holy Spirit is really less of a one-time event and and more about the relationship that we have with God a process of growing closer day by day to God through the Spirit regardless though John 21 happens after all of that has already occurred the disciples specifically including Peter They've already witnessed the resurrected Jesus. They've already seen him. And according to John's account, they've also received at least some measure of the Holy Spirit at this point, the one that was going to be poured out in the last days. And so there has to be more going on than just that Pentecost outpouring to make Peter what he needed to be. Because we're not seeing that Peter yet. John tells us that after chapter 20, he tells us with, with all of the encounters with the risen Lord, the commissioning, the, 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 the giving of the work, and the breathing of the Holy Spirit on them, there's still something that Peter is missing. So a group of them, seven total, uh, they, they, they're gathered together on the shores of Galilee. They've gone back to Galilee from Jerusalem. And, and Peter says, you know what, guys? I think I'm going to go fishing. It's a great thing to do when you're stressed out, believe me. Go fishing. I'm going to go fishing. And they say, all right, we'll, we'll come with you. We'll help out with this. And so they go out into the night, and the nighttime apparently is the right time to fish on the, the, the Sea of Galilee, and they, but they have no luck, no fish, completely skunked on this no, and nothing. And so dejected, they, they row back to shore. The early light is starting to shine, and the, there's this figure uh, uh, they can see him in the, in the darkness standing on the shoreline there. It's too dark to see who it is, but not too dark to hear him. And, you know, how fishermen like to have people give them advice. They hear this guy call out, Have you caught anything? Well, how about if you try on the other side of the boat? How many of you, how are you going to respond to that? As, as if, as if, this is silly, really, this, this unknown figure telling professional fishermen that if they just move over five or six feet to the other side of the boat, then you're going to have more luck as if the water on one side of the boat is, is more productive than the water on the other. But they do it. They do it, and, and then their nets are filled to the point of breaking, and suddenly they understand, oh, it's Jesus. Now Peter, in typical Peter fashion here, jumps out of the boat and he swims to shore. And, and there he finds another charcoal fire. Now he's grateful for the warmth, I'm sure, but maybe there's a little too much here that's like the, the high priest's courtyard to him in his mind. 
But this time, Jesus, Jesus is here. And after breakfast, Jesus pulls him aside to talk. Actually, John doesn't say that Jesus pulled him aside. That's just something I imagine happened. I think this would have been pretty raw for Peter if Jesus had had this conversation in front of all the others, but maybe that's how it went. Regardless, Jesus knows that he needs to have this conversation with Peter, and Peter needs to face this question. And it's, believe me, the only question that matters. It's the only question that matters. It's not, why'd you do it, Peter? Why did you betray me? It's not, why couldn't you have been more loyal, Peter? It's not, what happened to that promise that you'd never desert me? All of these questions could have been asked. But Jesus asks only the important question, do you love me? I think about Peter a lot. Now there seems to have been some tipping point for him where Peter finally gets it, finally understands, gets with the program where he finally figures out what following Jesus really means. And I'm less convinced that it's at Pentecost, even though that we have that powerful story from Acts 2 and it shows us how bold and how effective a spirit-filled Peter can be. I think that this story from John actually shows us that tipping point, that place where Peter gets it. It's not in the courtyard of the high priest. Peter's too far gone in his fear and his shame at that point to understand what Jesus expects. It's not in that first encounter with the risen Lord where he comes into that locked room and surprises them all there. I think that it was here, here, when Jesus fed them, when Jesus warmed them and when he asked Peter that most crucial question not once but three times do you love me Peter was given a chance at redemption at restoration Jesus wasn't interested in chucking him aside and and, and, in response to this horrible betrayal and believe me, if there was any, any legitimate reason to get rid of somebody, this would have been it. To shake that dead weight off or to dust from their feet, this was it. Peter, in no way deserved to be numbered among the faithful followers of Jesus. But thank God that getting rid of failures is not what Jesus is about. Jesus is about the comeback. I do believe that there is a tipping point when we can look back and we can say, this is where it happened. This is the point. This is where things change. But tipping points may always come somewhere in this long process of becoming holy. You see, Peter didn't have to be a stumbling block to Jesus. He just was. Peter didn't have to betray Jesus. He did, though. It was not a foregone conclusion that Peter would need to come back, even though on our own none of us really succeeds in our faithfulness. Even after Pentecost, when the Spirit had been such a visible and audible presence for Peter, he still needed to be nudged by Paul to be a little more inclusive and to accept the Gentiles as well as the Jews. Peter is proof that he's proof of the process of discipleship the way that it works out, and it's an outworking, even if that process consists of powerful events along the way. But the power of this story from John, it's not really the way that that Peter seems to have reached some tipping point and was able to be the apostle that he was meant to be after this, finally becoming a faithful follower. The power of the story is the way that Jesus is always calling us back. No matter how far we fall, no matter how much we betray, no matter how much we turn from Jesus, Jesus always wants us back. Because this is not just a story about Peter. It's a story about us. The resurrection of Jesus, it's not just an event that happened a long time ago. The whole implication of the resurrection is that Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive, that he is present to us right now in this place. 
and that His Spirit continues to inform and equip and inspire us. The resurrection is about the living Jesus who calls to each of us from the shore. We've, we've gone out fishing. We're out there doing the things in our lives that we feel like we need to do to make it through. All that mundane stuff that, that occupies our time and our thoughts. And Jesus calls us from the shore. He calls to each of us. And we have a chance to respond like Peter, we can dive in and, and swim to shore uh, to Jesus. But once we get to shore, whether we row the boat in or we swim like Peter did, once we get there, though, we may be confronted. We may be confronted with all of the failures and all the betrayals that so mark our lives. We may have to face the fact that when we said that we would follow, we didn't. We may have to face the fact that when we said that we would be loyal, we weren't. We ended up rejecting Jesus and choosing something over Jesus again and again and again in our lives. We may need the comeback. But Jesus is going to ask that most important question. The only question that he asks us all along this process of discipleship. He'll ask if we love him. And if we love Jesus... Love Him with everything that we've got, all of our heart and our soul and our mind and our strength, then we can have a comeback too. No matter how far we've gone, we can have a comeback too. We can become what Jesus wants us to be and do what Jesus wants us to do. So this Resurrection Sunday, and I'll tell you, every Sunday is Resurrection Sunday when you live with a living God. But this Resurrection Sunday, we need to remember this. Regardless of where we are in our relationship with Jesus, wherever you are, wherever it feels like you are with Jesus, whether we've never really considered Jesus the Lord of our lives, we never really thought about it in that way, or if we found ourselves like Peter again and again and again, running out into the night, racked with guilt, weeping bitterly as we realize that we're not what we thought we were, Jesus calls us all from the shore, inviting us, beckoning to us, come on in. But be ready. When you respond to that call, the resurrection, it means you're not going to meet some abstraction, some idea, a theological principle. When you head to shore, in response to Jesus' call, you're heading to shore to meet the living Lord, the resurrected Jesus. And he's going to ask you about your loyalty and your devotion and your commitment. He's going to ask you if you love him. And all it takes to turn it all around, to be restored, to have that comeback is to say, yes, Lord, you know that I do. Let's pray together. Gracious, loving, heavenly Father, you are kind and you are patient because your kindness and your patience lead us to repentance. Even those of us who have claimed you, who have acknowledged Jesus as Lord of our lives, who have, have believed in him, we still stumble, we still fall, and we still fail. We are more like Peter, Lord, than we would like to admit. But as this story reminds us, we know that we can never fall too far that you are always reaching out to us, beckoning us to come back, to come home, to be yours, to love you. Lord, it is a challenge for us at times to face the ways in which we've stumbled and the ways in which we've failed. But your love is greater than that challenge. 
Your love is greater than our shame and our guilt. Your grace covers all of this. And for this we praise you and give you thanks. Keep, keep calling to us, Lord. Keep beckoning us. Keep asking us that most important question. Help us to love you more deeply and more fully and more obediently every day. We thank you for this day where we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. We thank you for what it means to us and how it promises us eternal life with you. Because what better thing can there be than to be with you for eternity? So we praise you today. We pray all these things in the name of Christ. Amen. As I mentioned before, we did not have a chance to do our regular love feast uh, where we would have ordinarily shared in communion, which means that we get to do it today. It's not always the most common thing for us in the Church of the Brethren to share uh, communion on an Easter Sunday, but we're going to try to do this today. For those of you who have been with us and have, have taken communion in these days of COVID, um, we do it a little differently than the normal passing of the, of the trays back and forth. We're going to invite you to come forward and receive both a cup and then a small cup with a piece of bread in it. So you'll have both of them, and then we'll have you go back and take your seats. Um, and then once we get everybody served and everybody seated, then we will proceed with the, uh, with the time of reflection and the prayers and the, the sharing and the elements. Uh, so it's, the first part is a little bit of a logistical thing uh, where we simply try to get these things into your hands as graciously as we possibly can. Um, and so the way I would like to invite us to do this, I'd like to invite the folks on the outside here to make your way to the back and come up the center, and then you can go back to your seats. And then once they're all served and, and seated again, then we'll do a similar thing with the, the rows here, where if you'll make your way to the outside and then curve around and come back this way. There is a challenge. Some of you may find coming to the front a little bit more challenging or difficult, and so we invite you, if possible, you can stay, and maybe your neighbor can bring you that if you're comfortable with that, or we can come to you and serve you as well. So uh, look around you, see who you're, you're being uh, uh, with and, and who you might be serving, and, and, and think of them. Everybody understand? It's not too difficult. <laughs> But we'll try to do this. And I do want to encourage you. Our, our tra practice in the Church of the Brethren is that this is the Lord's table. This is not a place where we decide who he is and who isn't. We leave that to you. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, then you are a welcome at this table, whether this is your community of faith or not. We want you to feel comfortable with that. We also, though, want you to feel comfortable with the idea of not partaking, I don't know what the word for that would be, of refraining today. If there's anything for whatever reason that you feel like you need to step back from communion, this is perfectly, we're, we're fine with that. There's no judgment about it. We want you to feel like you're doing what it is that the Lord has led you to do today. So, I asked if Gary would help me serve. And you may need to turn that down, Mark. Thank you. If the folks from the side would come around. Have them, have them take it.
sister. Brother? Sister? Brother? Sister? Brother? Come to the table of Jesus, our Redeemer. Jesus invites you here as part of the people of God. Come to the table humbly, not because you have earned a place here, but because you need mercy and help. Come because you love God and want to love God more. Come because Jesus first loved us and gave himself for us. Come because you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Come because you want to experience the mystery of God's grace. Let us prepare our hearts in silence. I invite you to bow. On the night that he was handed over, Jesus had a meal with his friends. He took a loaf of bread and after giving thanks to God, he broke it and gave it to his disciples. He said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. The bread of life, Jesus' body, broken for you. Let us take it together. After supper, Jesus took a cup of wine, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, remember me. The blood of Christ was shed for you. Let's drink it together. Let's read this final prayer together. God, our creator, thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, whose love pursues us our whole life long. Thank you, Jesus, for giving your life to us in word and deed, even unto death, even death on a cross. Come, Holy Spirit, feed us with your love that we may be filled with power to love God with all our hearts, souls, and minds. Amen. We have come to the Lord's table. We have eaten the bread of heaven. God is the one who will transform us so that we can see with Jesus' eyes, hear with Jesus' ears, speak with Jesus' mouth, so that we can be the body of Christ in the world, proclaiming the good news of God's reign together. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen.
And as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord, we're going to sing a song that is triumphant. And it's, it's where we live. Let's stand as we sing, I live because he is risen. again. Lord, we ask a blessing on these, your people. They live because Jesus lives. We ask that you would keep them, protect them, give them opportunities to share your love in the world. And we thank you that we do not serve an idea, but we serve a living God who is with us at all times. We praise you. We thank you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. He is risen. You may go in peace.